come. We have a sorting ceremony to get to. Welcome everyone, Quistine here with my review of Hogwarts Legacy, the long-awaited game set in the Harry Potter universe about a century before the events of the main series. This is a game that I've long awaited as a Harry Potter fan. I read the books while I was growing up, I watched the movies, and I read lots and lots of fan fiction. I still do to this day. There's some very talented authors when it comes to fan fiction stories, and Harry Potter has more fan fiction stories than any other universe, probably most of them put together even, there's that many people, especially of a certain age group, that have been interested in this universe because they grew up with uh, this universe. And JK Rowling, for all the issues that she's had over the years, for all her piss poor management of the Potter universe, the Harry Potter universe, she did connect with people in a way many authors have not been able to with the books that she wrote. Especially the first four books, I would say, were really immersive for anyone, like young ki uh, young children, teenagers, adults. Uh, there was something that connected you to this world and connected you to Harry's story. So how does this game handle that? Is it a good game? Is a game worth paying money for? Is it a game that stays faithful to the source material? I would say, Yes, in short, I would say yes. I'm going to go over the details, but in short, I would absolutely say that it is. Now, let's go over some details one at a time. I'm in the room of requirement, which is basically the housing area of this game. So you've got, you've got your main chamber here where you enter, then two side rooms. You can brew potions, you can make a bunch of things. Uh, over here but really the main purpose of the room of requirement seems to be uh, that uh, you can brew potions that you can uh, then use though I might need to move uh, some of those things um, because it's not necessarily in the best possible area right there so there are certainly options I'll go into a bit more detail but suffice to say the room of requirement is just exists really to uh, well, for people that do care about housing, this is the place where you will be able to do it. But uh, let me just go over. Uh, let me just go over some of the settings, some of the controls, and how they handle. So settings-wise, on PC, this is on PC. We do have upscaling, so we have the LSS. We can turn it off, though I would not necessarily recommend it because the LSS is pretty good in terms of giving you quality. In fact, you might actually use uh, the LSS quality as a form of anti-aliasing to get uh, to get really good image uh, quality. You can also increase the sharpness. For whatever reason, this seems to not save very well. Um, but then you've got you've got other choices of upscaling. So you've got FSR, XESS, and NIS, which I guess is um, it's it's uh, NVIDIA upscaling, but not the LSS. So it's not as good. Then HDR, you can increase the field of view plus 20. So I'm guessing by default it's probably like something like 90. Uh, so you can increase it to a decent amount. I would have personally preferred more. Then we have options to disable or enable motion blur, the field, chromatic aberration, and film grain. Personally, I've only played with film grain on. I've disabled all these three. I like to disable all those three. Um, then we've got the video settings in greater detail. You've got various choices, but basically it boils down to low, medium, high, and ultra. Now, I've personally been playing on high it runs well, but it does have significant performance dips, memory leak, stuttering in certain areas. There is a patch that's coming out today from what I've heard that is supposed to improve performance. And it seems like the performance seems to be worse on PC, especially on NVIDIA GPUs, than on consoles. It feels like PC was a secondary objective for them when it came to the development of the game as opposed to consoles and as opposed to... AMD hardware. Uh, then you've got ray tracing, reflection shadows, and ambient occlusion. So how does the game run? That is a simple question to answer. Or not so simple, really. 
So in an area like this, right, the game, you, I could max out the game in an area like this. In a, a short, in a small area like this, I could max out the settings of the game and I could get 90, 70, 80, 90 FPS. And that includes ray tracing. And I have a GPU that's not so good when it comes to ray tracing performance, just to be clear on that, because I have a 2080 Super. Can't aff I couldn't afford the 3000 series or 4000 series even now. So I'm stuck with the 2080 Super. Uh, prices have certainly risen dramatically as of late when it comes to GPUs. But the 2080 Super doesn't have gr good ray tracing performance. But in an area like this, I can max out, get great performance. And in areas that are devoid of a lot of NPCs, where you don't have crowds of students milling about or anything like that, the performance can be good. But there's a lot of areas where the performance drops. And it drops regardless of settings. You could set things to low and you'll still get really poor performance. Now, why is this happening? Well, apparently poor optimization to the degree that people discovered that you could just download an NVIDIA DLSS file that was more up to date than what the developers put in in the game and that the game would run better. Now, it's not perfect that DLSS file, but I went from like 60 or so FPS in certain areas, like even in, let's say, uh, good areas, and from there to like 70 plus FPS. And that's on ultra settings, though I've mostly been playing on high because you do get massive performance drops. Whenever, like you can enter a room, for instance, if you're looking in a corner of the room, you're getting like 10, 20 FPS, then you're getting all of a sudden 70, 80. That is a bit ridiculous when we're thinking about uh, performance. So performance is highly questionable at the moment uh, at the moment in the game like it can run well it can also run really po poorly it's all over the place when it comes to the performance of the game and it does certainly detract from the experience especially since many of the those performance steps tend to happen within cinematics what about controls let's talk about mouse and keyboard controls well for the most part they're pretty solid like casting spells using the default controls is all pretty good there are some things that are a bit uh, irritating when it comes to it, but it does tend to work very well. Now, here's how the game works when it comes to to controls with mouse and keyboard, or just controls in general. Let's say you have a spell and you can target certain things. Like in this case, I've uh, I switched to certain spells that work here in the room of requirement. Like they can affect the paintings, they can affect the entire environment. And yeah, this place is highly customizable, though it's mostly fluff, really. Um, but if I'm looking at something and it's highlighting that object, then when I cast a spell, let's say the basic attack, and then it's going to hit the object that is highlighted. That's how spell casting works. You can hold down your right mouse button, and you can do uh, you can do um, uh, you can do manual aiming. But if you're doing this, you're going to uh, you're going to um, uh, you're obviously going to have a bit of a harder time when it comes uh, to movement. They can certainly cast spells in this, but generally speaking, the basic way of just like left clicking to attack if a, an object is highlighted does tend to work pretty well. Now let's look, take a look at the keybinds of the game itself and what should be changed it, if anything. For the most part, I keep the keybinds as they are with some exceptions, uh, in particular when it comes to mounts. So with mounts, I would probably look to switch up, fly up and fly down keys, cause like, uh, just so you could switch that for instance to W and S, though in this case, uh, the default c control for fly down was control. So I switched that to alt, I just feel it's easier uh, to reach with that. Beyond that, for most part, the controls are fairly functional. The only, the only irritant really is trying to get on a broom. Um, then there's Protego. Protego by default is set to Q. Now it's pretty awkward, and I really wish developers that set up mouse and keyboard controls actually understood this. Like, put yourself in the situation, right? You have to hold down Q. Then you're trying to press one, right? Well, the finger you're using to hold down Q to block a spell is the same finger you're gonna use to to use the spell. So for instance, if I wanna do one, right? 
then I can't do Q at the same time. But by switching it to caps lock, um, by switching it to caps lock, it is so much easier to uh, it is so much easier uh, to just uh, do these two actions because I'm using my pinky to hit uh, to use the Protego spell. And it's like I get so much better reactions from that. I get it. Caps Lock is not necessarily a bind. People want to use. There's, I don't know, some psychological level there. It's like, I don't want to use Caps Lock. But it's a really good bind, by the way. can be a bit annoying. I know when you tab out and you're trying to type you to your friend and all that. But it's not really too much of an issue. And you do, do get used to it. So that's one of the things I would... Um, um, I would switch. There's a lot of customization when it comes to the keybinds, the responsiveness. Let's talk about this. The responsiveness of controls are pretty good. And crucially, what I like here is you can customize the keybinds for every single game, mini game. Like you've got Alohomora, the spell mini game, telescope mini game, parcel tongue. <laughs> I haven't even gotten to doing parcel tongue, by the way, uh, in the game at the moment. But you do have a lot of choices when it comes to the controls of uh, of this game. So that's good. That's very appreciated that you can customize things however way you want. You don't have to use, right? You don't have to use um, uh, you you don't have to use the same uh, keys for like. For um, for like spells that you have to do that uh, you can use in a mini game, for instance, you can change those around. If there's any particular uh, frustration, it comes down to mounting up. Let me explain on that. Um, this is the only genuine frustration that I have with the uh, key control. So when you want to mount up on a broom, you have to uh, hold down tab, and you can see the problem there. I right? just press tab, so I use the potion there. Well, what you want to do is you, you have to hold down tab, then you have to go to this menu, and then you can mount your broom or whatever ground mount you're using, right? But it is an issue, as you might imagine. You don't have, like, I haven't seen any key over here, and I've looked, like, there's no key here just to mount up. I would love to have a key specifically. I would also like it for the tools menu, because that's the, the tools menu. I would also like it for the tools menu to to uh, not, not work based on holding down the same key that you use to actually activate a tool, because that can be pretty annoying. So that is the only frustration when it comes to the controls. The performance is all over the place. The controls are mostly fine. The response time is great. Granted, I've been playing with NVIDIA Reflex Mode on with Boost on, so maybe that does help with my response time. But for the most part, when I'm looking at the controls of this game, it is a really good uh, control scheme that they set up by default for the most part. Just switching Protego out for Caps Lock, uh, that will do that that will improve things by quite a bit and and maybe and switching and switching your fly down key from control to to alt because like with that like just an idea when you're flying right you want to use WSND so your many of your fingers are going to be occupied with that then you've got uh, then you want to potentially adjust your speed which is going to require your pinky so that means your thumb is on the only finger you have free to really switch without moving your fingers away from other parts of your keyboard. Your thumb is your only finger that could that could you know handle altitude. There now it's annoying that altitude isn't handled by the mouse. That is frustrating, uh, and you have to use the keyboard for that. But uh, but if you just switch the key from like Control to Alt you will be able to swap between space and alt and control your altitude. Flying is not bad. The flying the flying itself is pretty fine. It's just the controls are kind of lackluster when it comes uh, to flying. Like, I, I don't get the altitude situation. Like, you can change direction with, with the mouse, but not so much alt altitude. It, it just feels a bit uh, frustrating. Hell, you know what? I would even take 
like just using the mouse buttons. Like I guess I could switch. I could use the mu left and right mouse button for altitude control. There's nothing stopping me from setting it up. Uh, but outside of some very questionable uh, decisions and some the default controls, for the most part, it works fine. It's pretty functional. It's good. Now let's talk about the open world uh, aspect. This is an open world RPG and many open world RPGs can struggle with the dilemma of pushing people towards doing the story but also exploring the world. I think that at points that the developers of Hogwarts Legacy do a brilliant job while at other stages they fall completely flat on their faces. Let me explain. This is the world of Hogwarts Legacy this entire valley, the Hogwarts Valley, this entire area, it's pretty large, but you might notice the problem. I haven't really explored it. I've done a majority of the main story missions, in fact, of the main story itself. Um, like, I'm not considering companion quests here, but of the main story itself, I've probably done close to two thirds of it. And the area I've been in could be limited to a bit of the Hogwarts Valley, South Hogwarts region, Hogsmeade, and just a bit of the North and Forbidden Forest. The vast, the majority of the game is unexplored, and therein lies, uh, therein lies a problem. But what's going on here? Well, the developers do incentivize you to explore. They do incentivize you to go around the world and find various secrets. The reason behind that is that's how you level through exploration through the field guide pages. Like at the beginning of the game, you get the field guide and all the pages are uh, ripped apart and thrown around the world. So you're incentivized to go around the world and find them. They're in Hogwarts, they're in Hogsmeade in particular. Okay, so that's good because it pushes you as a player to explore because your best way of leveling is to just find secrets in the world, to find those field pages, uh, field guide pages in particular in Hogwarts and Hogsmeade and of course to engage in, uh, in other activities. But exploration is a pretty big aspect of this game. That's great, and there's various um, challenges. There's various puzzles to do, riddles to do, door puzzles, etc. Exploration, and so on and so forth. I, I kind of dislike the fact that you are pushed into a situation to cast Ravello, the revealing spell, a lot in this game, and I kind of dis dislike the highlight that it put, puts on objects. Um, but for the most part, I do like how the actual exploration is. You have to pay attention, you have to keep in mind what you're doing. There's various secrets to find, various challenges to overcome. That's great. Like one of the highlights for me was encountering a challenge in the Forbidden Forest that would, that gave me access to some very, very interesting spells, the, mo the most powerful uh, spells in the game just for that particular challenge. I'll get into that in just a bit when I start talking about spells. That's great. There's there's a genuine sense of wonder and discovery, like adventure. Like that's the core of Harry Potter, adventure and wonder. Uh, and this game delivers on that. They're, they're, not all the challenges are as good as the others. The one that I find the most annoying, to be honest with you, is this one with the cabinets and the flying keys. I know it's a callback to the first Harry Potter book and the first movie. But it is annoying having to get these keys because they're next to these cabinets, then they fly to the cabinets, and then you have to slap them right when they're flying over the keyhole to fit them in and open there. And all you get really for this is a transmog set for your character if you get 16 of these. Doing this 16 times, not necessarily all that fun. But that's just one aspect, right? There's various challenges. There's challenges in Hogwarts. There's various puzzles in Hogwarts and the open world. For the most part, well done, and the focus on exploration is great. But here's the problem. Here's where it falls apart. And the main issue that I have with this game from an open world perspective. A lot of areas, a lot of the game will be locked off unless you do main story missions which to me is a huge detriment to both the story and the exploration aspect of the game. Because if people just rush the main story because they can't, they get frustrated because they can't unlock areas without doing those stories, the main story, uh, then they'll just do the main story and ignore the exploration aspect because it's just going to get repetitive, right? The problem with open world games in general is that open world gets repetitive. It's the main story that adds variety of missions and all that. So the best situation from my perspective when it comes to an open world game is to have a balance between main story missions and exploration 
and side missions. This game does not do that. The problem is, while you want to level through the field guide, a lot of areas will be locked off because you are going to lack certain spells or you're going to lack certain equipment. To give you some context, you will get to, you'll get a bunch of spells early on that will allow you access to a lot of areas. That's great. In particular, once you arrive at Hogwarts, the next day, the first proper day as a student of Hogwarts, you'll get access to two spells, Accio and Leviosa, which will unlock a lot of areas. Problem is, there's a lot of things that won't be unlocked. There's a lot of locked doors, there's areas with spider webs that you need incendio to burn through, which takes a lot longer to unlock. And then there's this massive open world map, which requires you to get the broomstick. But the problem is, you need to do about a third of the main story missions to get access to broom flying. You need to do about half of the main story missions, or close to that, in order to unlock the Alahomora spell, which honestly you should have from level 1. I don't understand the logic of some things. Like, broom flying, a third of the main story? Okay, Alahomora, half of the main story, when you have numerous closed areas with locks, and by the way, you only get level 1 of Alahomora, then you have to do an entire quest and find a bunch of objects in the world, or in Hogwarts, rather, in order to unlock the higher levels of Alahomar to properly use it. Which is pretty frustrating when you have to deal with that. It's not, it's not a great experience and it is highly detrimental to the exploration of the world because when you start realizing that, oh, I'm not going to be able to go everywhere I want or a lot of doors are going to be closed and I'm going to miss secrets, I'm like, why should I explore if I have to come back here in 20 levels just to open some doors? Like, I would rather just come here when I can open everything at once. But the problem with that is you will start getting bored, I imagine, with the open world if you don't have a narrative thread to keep it together. Like, if you've already beaten the narrative by that point or a significant chunk of it, then the open world will start becoming boring because of it. And so I think that the design from that perspective is not great. At least not so far, right? I haven't beaten the entire game, but it really does suck to have so many missing features that require you to spend so many hours doing uh, main story missions. Like, I think the game would have been far better if we had access to a lot of stuff much earlier and you would still have had a major incentive to explore. In fact, a greater incentive to explore. So I think they really miss their mark when it comes to that. But exploration, challenges, puzzles, they're all there. There's just this frustration of having limitations due to lacking the toolbox, due to a limited access to the toolbox. And that's just part of it, by the way. Let's talk about talents and the room of requirement and cu character customization. So in the room of requirement, what do you get? Well, you get several rooms that you can customize. You do this customization through several very specific spells. The conjuring spell, the altering spell, and Evanesco, which allows you to clear away, which allows you to clear away certain items. So, hey, I don't like this table. Goodbye and I get the material, the Moonstone material, that you can use to craft it. Now, what's the purpose of the Room of Requirement? What purpose does it serve? Well, it takes you quite a bit to get to it, and it's not all going to be unlocked right out of the gate. Why do I say that? Well, at the moment, what I can do in the Room of Requirement is I can make potions. So I, can, I have a potions table, though you get the ability to craft potions even outside of the Room of Requirement much earlier in the game. I have a potting table, again, something I can get access to outside of here, though I can uh, do, uh, I can, um, I can get more slots over here, that's the main advantage. I also have these three cauldrons that every 12 minutes or so, they're gonna make me a random potion, so right now I'm gonna be swimming in potions in the game. Now, the room of requirement feels like, how do we add transfiguration to the game? That's probably how they were viewing this particular uh, situation. And what they decided to do is, is, while you do have some level of transfiguration in the open world as well, of course, or you will, I haven't actually accessed anything uh, like that. While you will, the problem, uh, the problem is obviously, uh, how do you handle that uh, very well? 
And so they decided to add a lot of customization to their own requirement, and it's also basically your housing. Though the main purpose is to give you potions and herbs. But that's not the only purpose of it. So you've got potions, herbology, and util utility wall hangings. Like, you've got a bunch of customization um, options over here. But the three main things are, like, potions, herbology, and utility. Utility can contain a bunch of things. Like, there's gear that, could, that may need to be identified, so that's one of the things. But you'll also, um, you'll also want material, like, there's these uh, moonstones, which is the, which are the materials that are needed to craft anything in here. You can get a bunch of them in the open world. You don't necessarily need to get like science, um, like you don't necessarily need to get scientific material or refiner, uh, refiner or anything like that. But one thing that can be pretty important when it comes to this is the enchanted loom. Why is that? Well, let's start talking about gear customization. So basically, the room is there to give you materials like potions, herbs. Uh, that you use in potions as well as gear upgrades identifying gear and upgrading the gear why is that well so gear may have slots in this case we do have trait slots right but you need the loom through uh, the room of requirement to be able to use that keep in mind this is over half of the main story done so far and i ha don't have access to it so it does take you a very, very, very long time to be able to access uh, those those traits. So that's the pur that's the purpose of the room of requirement. Now let's talk a bit about gearing. Uh, like obviously we do have uh, we do have the the traits. Like for instance, the Stinger dueling gloves. They have an increased spell damage while concealed by disillusionment, which, yeah, you can use stealth to a certain extent. You don't have an invisibility cloak, you do have a disillusionment spell, however. Um, but generally speaking, it's pretty straightforward. HP is increased via the level you have. You can get certain traits on gear that increases, that gives you various benefits, all well and good. Um, and then gear slots may either have offense or defense. So defense, yeah, determines how well you block and defend against attacks. Offense, how well you attack. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Nothing too special when it comes to that. What I do like, however, when it comes to the character system, the customization system, like beyond the you know character customization options, like how you look and all that kind of stuff, though there's only two vo voices and pitch for those voices. But what I like here is from the very start of the game, you have a transmog system, right? You can change the appearance of every gear piece to any other, and you don't need to keep stuff in your inventory. Once you've unlocked a gear piece or a certain look, you will always keep that look, even when you sell the item and get rid of it. So for instance, these gloves, or you can go without, right? These gloves, I don't have these anymore, but I still have the appearance. So you're further incentivized to explore, because while an item may not be good and you may not bother using it, right? You do have a reason to go there in the world, finding things, because it might suit, it might suit a particular look on your character better. You do have various options over here. Like, for instance, uh, actually, I think it's cloak. Um, not cloak, is it? Oh, there it is. So, for instance, hey, do you want to go out there with a the suit of armor? You can. There's one. Or I'm just going to go with a regular cloak. You can go with a robe. You can go with a scarf. You can go with in your pajamas if you so desire over here. That That's what it does when you're not wearing everything. You're like, you're in your pajamas, basically. Um, I guess that's uh, one appropriate way of handling that. So you do have a good amount of customization. If there's anything annoying about it is that whenever you equip a new piece of gear, you have to customize it itself, but that's not too big of an issue. Though I would kind of wish you, we could save some presets, like you could build item sets and you could keep those, those looks. Uh, but I do greatly appreciate the ability to customize uh, in a game um, ver uh, very e as easily as I can here. Now let's talk about talents, talent system. So talent-wise, it's going to take you about half 
or close to it of the main story quest the, the main main story not just anything that's considered the main quest but the actual stuff that you need to do right this uh purple uh right here um it's gonna take you over half of that to unlock the talent system which seems ridiculously long to me by the way now the level cap is 40 you you don't have enough talent points to get everything right because you've got 20 between spells and dark arts and you get 16 from core so that's 36 and then you got four from stealth so that's 40 itself though you could probably skip out on virtually everything in the room of requirement and there's certainly talents that you don't uh need right um personally i would probably skip out on a lot of things in the room of requirement or maybe some combination of things from room of requirement core and all that um, now, what's annoying here when it comes to the talent system is how long it takes to unlock it. But not because you're going to miss out the combat ability or utility, but rather because of the way the spell system works. So let me just leave this talent system and I'll, and I'll show you why. So you have, by default, a single spell bar, right? Four spells that can put on your, uh, on your bar. Now... You can get up to four spell bars, but each of each extra bar requires you to unlock it, unlock it through a talent in the core. Since you can only get talents very far in the main story, then it makes the experience to get there, especially as you are unlocking quite a few spells along the way, pretty annoying because it um, requires, <laughs> it means you'll be swapping out spells on your bar quite frequently. Which is not great. I, I do dislike having the four slots limitation. I do dislike the fact that it takes so long to unlock the talent system when it quite play, frankly should have been available from level one. Although maybe, you know, a level 10 system where so you would have a bunch of maybe a point where you would have a bunch of spells unlocked, but certainly not to the degree that, you, you know, you can spend hours just having to swap spells in and out. Or maybe a way, or maybe just having access to the core would have been great to be able to swap between the various spell sets. But yeah, not too fond of this particular system uh, as it currently exists. At least when it comes to that. Though there's certainly some useful things right here, like for instance, like, uh, you can get the disarm in curse, so Expelling Armas can have the same effect as a curse. Like, you can really customize, you, you can really gain some powerful effects. Or, for instance, from spells, uh, you can take Incendio and you can make it, uh, let me just show you what it does. You can take Incendio and it will do this. That's a massive amount of AoE. And the name of the game when it comes to that is obviously combinations of spells to really get the most out of it. That's the most effective way of uh, playing in common. But it is frustrating to have the limitation on the talent system for quite a lot of hours. I guess their thought process there was we don't want people to just throw their points and whatever, right? Without having to consider the implications. Maybe they also wanted people to have a certain fixed number of spells before they started spending points, because uh, you can't spend points in spells that you don't have unlocked. But since you can't get enough talent points for everything, then you do have to make decisions. I'm just annoyed because of the limit, because I had to do this a lot. Like I would enter a situation and then I'd have to, okay, uh, let's say I have a, a bunch of combat spells. Oh, but suddenly I need... Well, this is a problem when you only have a bar. But like, oh, I need a Luma spell, right? So I would have to do this a lot. Go into this menu, open it, switch the spells in and out, dependent on the situation. Not a great experience in a lot of ways. And it's even worse when it comes to gear. Let's talk about this. So... By default, you can only carry 20 gear pieces. This includes the gear that you have on your character. A lot of RPGs wouldn't necessarily do that. They would have inventory space different than the gear you're actually using. Not in this game. Right now, I've increased it to 28. But how do you increase it? Well, there are a bunch of... There, there is one way. And I believe... Um, I'm trying to figure out where exactly it is. No, not there. 
No, it's it's an exploration, right? So in order to increase your gear storage, you need to go and solve a bunch of Merlin trials. These are basically puzzles in the open world. You go, you do them, you increase your gear capacity. Not by a lot, so four for each of them. But it is annoying because those Merlin trials themselves are again locked on by the main story. So you have all of these limitations, limitation after limitation after limitation, kind of ruining your experience with the game even though it's got great graphics a great atmosphere great feel great voice acting it's hampered by just the severe limitations that they put for way too long in this game they generally screw it over that, that's my feeling on that subject with regards to the main story it is pretty simple in a lot of ways but it is very fitting for a harry potter video game you have an ancient power, you set out to discover more about said ancient power, but you get entangled in a fight against goblins and dark wizards hired by the goblins to help them with their problems. And you learn, learn more about the past. It is very fitting, even if it's not necessarily fully in line with the lore, though the game is pretty authentic. It is very accurate when it comes to the lore, though it adds on top of it the ancient magic that you're using, Though it is worth pointing out that even within the main book series, there was a bunch of magic and secrets that people didn't know about Hogwarts. So they're not going against the established lore with what they're doing with the story. For the most part, a couple of minor things here and there, but nothing too substantial when it comes to it. If I were to use a word with regards to the story, it would be casual. But it fits within what the Harry Potter should be about, which is exploration, wonder, discovery, and magic. And that is something that Hogwarts Legacy does pretty well. There is, however, a bit of an issue. Sometimes it's casual when it shouldn't be. So, the unforgivable curses. The unforgivable curses are a gameplay element. It feels to me that this is a difference between the, the the gameplay designers and the story designers. So the story designers wanted to tell like this child story, if you will, that's more casual, more laid back. Pretty fine, pretty solid as it is. I've played ultra, uh, I've played games with very uh, serious stories. I've read books, watched movies, all that. Having something more casual, more laid back, more about exploration and that sense of wonder that we got from the Harry Potter books. Perfectly appropriate. The problem with the Killing Curse and the other unforgivable spells, Crucio and Imperio, is using them casually like this as you do in a gameplay, from a gameplay standpoint, just doesn't feel right. Like even someone like Vord Voldemort or his Death Eaters, they weren't casually using Avada Kedavra on every single enemy. See, one of the points made within the Harry Potter universe from book four by Mad-Eye Moody is that, or rather his fake, uh, one of the big points made is that it's not easy to cast an unforgivable curse. It takes a great deal of intent and you have to have uh, hatred or very negative emotions towards the person you're casting it towards or else it's not going to work. You need to have a great deal of power. Now, let's say that your character does have that power, because certainly your character has a great deal of power within the story, so they should be able to match the power level. The problem is the intent aspect. Basically, you're playing a murdering psychopath in this game, and the game doesn't acknowledge it. Like, even if you're not using the unforgivable curses, you're still butchering your way through hundreds and hundreds of people, and you're, you're the hero? I mean, grant the goblins and the dark wizards, they're not good people in the story, but... There should be a point where you're, where someone says, hey, you're a murderer. Literally, you are a murderer, especially if you're using the unforgivable curses. Now, I don't like morality systems in RPGs. I think that it limits the complexity of decisions. But, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a moral dimension to your game. And that's certainly something that's lacking. Because there's that disconnect between gameplay and story. Like... Story-wise, fair enough, right? You're not doing anything too horrible, but gameplay-wise, you are doing very horrible things. 
you're engaging in murder and mass murder because even if you're not using Avada Kedavra or Crucio or Imperio, you're still in, uh, you're still killing people with all the other spells uh, that that you're doing. And by the way, this was something that the books acknowledge. Like, not it's not just about like, oh, you're killing someone to have a, uh, Avada Kedavra. No, I mean Harry himself in book six got in serious trouble because he almost killed Draco with the spell. He didn't know the effects of it, and with the uh, Unforgivables, there was always a power and a weight, even when someone like Voldemort uh, used them. Like when he was, when Voldemort used the Vada Cadaver, that was a pretty serious moment every time he did it in the book. So just using these spells casualties or uh, casually or just casually butchering hundreds and hundreds of animals and people doesn't quite sit well with me when it comes down to it. Like... I think that either they should have handled this differently or explored the moral dimensions of that, but they decided to make a casual, fun adventure game, and that's what this game is. And I understand it, I appreciate it, and I enjoy it a great deal, but I can't help but notice that disconnect, especially as a Harry Potter fan, because like if you've read the books, if you're into the universe, then you know why these curses are so horrible, why they're so out there. Be it's not just the effects they have on the people that they're cast on. Like Crucio is is a torture spell that makes any kind of torture invented by humanity throughout its uh, throughout its history seem insignificant in comparison. Avada Kedavra is an instant killing spell. Imperial literally takes someone's uh, free will away. These, like, they're absolutely terrible. But the problem with these spells is that is the uh, effect, the mental effect that they have on the people actually casting them. This is a point made again and again and again within the context of the books, within the context of the universe, that you don't just casually cast Crucio or Imperio or Avada Kedavra. You don't just do that casually. It's a fairly serious effect that has an enormous negative impact on the person doing it. That's one of the things that J.K. Rowling got really well with her books. And so just having Avada Kedavra as an instant uh, killing spell in the context of the game, and then your character is just very happy that they won the fight that they just have, just doesn't sit well with me. That's one of the things that does drag it down. Otherwise, the story is okay. It's not ultra serious. It's casual. It's laid back. It can be a great deal of fun. Um, but just the slaughter that you're engaging in is pretty far out there. I gotta say, it it is insane the degree that w to which you butcher people and no one seems to care. You don't care. Like your player character doesn't care. Other characters don't react to it. Yes, I understand that the, the unforgivables are acquired for quests. Uh, where this uh, this is explored to an extent, but outside of that particular context, it doesn't seem to matter in any major way, shape, or form, which I feel is a letdown when it comes to the story aspect of the game. Finally, let's talk a bit about combat in uh, this game. Yes, Avada Kedavra is a fun spell to use to instantly kill enemies. I mean, granted, at least it has some weight when you're actually casting, like you have that special kind of like camera movement when you're doing it. But let's talk a bit about spells. So, looking at the spell list, you have uh, different categories of spells. Like, yeah, the Killing Curse, the killing curse, the Unforgivables, they're their own special car categories. They're basically the buttons you press when you want to be, I am Voldemort. I win, game over, basically. Like, you could just put, like, once you unlock them, you could just put them in a separate spell tab and just access them when you would just want to uh, trivialize any fight you're in, because they are that powerful. Um, but beyond these special spells, uh, what do you have? Well, you have the blue spells. Now, the blue spells and the green, well, the light green spells, they're basically environmental spells, if you will. Like, Lumos will light the way, the Lucian Men Charm will make you invisible, all that. They're utility spells in the world. They don't have an impact on combat. The light green spells can only be used in the room of requirements. So for combat, you're left with red, purple, and yellow spells. Yellow and purple are mainly control spells, like Leviosa, for instance. And it's a bit weird, because you have Leviosa, and then you have Wingardium Leviosa, which, uh, like, it's basically the same thing, but for whatever reason, they made it different. But okay, so yellow, purple... And purple are control spells. Red 
uh, is basically damage spells, different kind of effects. Now, the way it works, uh, the way spell casting works in the game, um, you want to control enemies with either yellow or purple, and you may want to break their shields with yellow or pu purple, depending on the kind of shields they have. They can also have red shields, so you might need to use red line, red spells to break their shields. So you have these uh, different, uh, you have those control spells, and then you want to do damage with the red spells. That's essentially it. You also have a basic attack that can do a decent amount of damage. But the goal of combat is to use combinations of spells, because spells, each spell has cooldowns. There's a way to reduce it through like potions, uh, talents, I believe. Like there's some talents that can reduce uh, reduce the cooldown of spells. But basically, you want to combine ability to do the maximum amount of damage. There's other things to consider as well. You can dodge, you can jump, and you can block spells or counter spells with Protego, though it won't work against every action. Like, Protego is basically a parry move in the context of the game. Pretty effective, too. And it casts Stupefy if you get Perfect Parry, uh, which uh, does create and make an enemy more vulnerable. There's various effects that you can use. Like, for instance, you might put a Curse Effect for the Dark Arts on some of these spells, like Expeller Armus having a Curse Effect, which means enemies take more damage. You can also spread that Curse to multiple enemies. So, so it's a combination of things. You don't just use, like, oh, I just uh, do a red line skill or do a bunch of red uh, red skills, red spells on an enemy. That's it. There, that that might work against weaker enemies, but against more powerful enemies, you're gonna have to do a combination of spells in order to get the most um, most amount of power within a fight. Then there's the ancient magic itself, which is its own separate thing. The ancient magic basically is your combos, uh, your combo meter, or your fury if you're thinking about God, God of War. Or Spartan Rage, rather. Um, the way it works is you can pick, a, by default with Ancient Magic, using the Z key, uh, you can pick up the obje objects, including weapons that you might get from enemies if you use Expelling Armas to re remove their weapons. You can pick up weapons and throw them at enemies. But building combos, taking damage, doing damage, will increase your blue uh, bar. Now, once you get one full bar, you can press X to do a special attack. Generally, some kind of environmental magic, like a thunderbolt on an enemy, or picking the enemy up and just throwing him around the room, doing significant damage. It will instantly kill most weaker enemies, and it will do significant damage even against more powerful enemies. It's not a Vada Kedavra, but it is basically the clean version, so to speak, of a killing curse. That's uh, that's the way it works. So you have the combination of spells that you want to use uh, between uh, red, uh, between red spells, purple spells, yellow spells. Then you have the blue spells, the blue combat spells for the ancient um, for the ancient magic. And then you have the instant I win button through Avada Kedavra and the incredibly potent spells through uh, the Unforgivables. That's how the combat works. It actually feels pretty great. You're not necessarily going to be the most mobile in combat. It's not really so much about dodging or anything like that. It's more about controlling a fight, like levitating enemies, breaking their shields, doing damage. Or let's say you can upgrade your Accio spell to affect nearby targets. So you can pull groups of enemies to you and then just hit them all with an incendio to do significant damage. Uh, damage to all of them in a certain radio. So there's a great deal of variety in terms of the fights. There's uh, environmental damage to be accounted for when, it, when you're thinking about the ancient magic. And then there's, of course, an element of stealth. Like you can go into a camp of enemies, use a charm to make yourself uh, invisible, though it's not perfect invisibility, and then basically wipe everyone out in that camp. So those are your choices. I'd say the combat system is... Uh, the combat system along with the exploration system are certainly the highlights of the game as well as, of course, the music, the graphics, especially on an artistic uh, le level, the way they rendered Hogwarts in-game is great. So, conclusion. Let's talk about the game as a whole. How do I feel about it? Well, I think if you're a Harry Potter fan, this is a game that you want to play. It's a pretty solid game. It's not the best game in the world. It does have its level of frustration and silliness. And you could argue problematic. I hate that word, but I do find a bit of a problem the way they handle like the mass murder you engage in. But overall, 
despite those issues, the poor performance, some, some minor control issues, the limitations on talents and exploration options until you've completed a significant portion of the main story, I would certainly say it's a game worth playing. It is an enjoyable game, it's a fun game, and you you will like it. Now, I can't speak from the perspective of someone who isn't a Harry Potter fan, because I am a Harry Potter fan, but I'm also the kind of person who isn't um, encumbered by nostalgia. Like, if something's bad, even in a universe that I like, I'll openly say it. This game is not bad. This game is pretty good on a lot of levels. In fact, that's what makes the frustrating elements of this game that much more frustrating, because there's a lot of good quality things here, it's just they're limited by like limitations in how long it takes you until to get the talent system, or how long it takes you until you get the La Homora spell, or things like that. There is a level of frustration with that, but I'll be honest, I've put 20 hours into this game already according to Steam, 24 hours according to Steam. And I've enjoyed every step of it. I haven't felt frustrated with the exception of, like limitation spells, but I haven't really felt genuinely frustrated uh, playing this game. I haven't felt like I just want to throw away my keyboard, which has happened in a lot of games. I feel, feel like the difficulty curve is decently handled. I feel the design of the world is pretty great. The graphics are pretty good. Frustrations with performance, frustration with limitations and like certain uh, uh, not being able to explore certain areas until you get to a certain point in your story. But overall, a very solid, very enjoyable experience. I wish it had a more serious take on the story than just the casual adventure, but it does work well in the context of a Harry Potter game. And you know what, after so many years of ultra serious games that have to tackle global politics and, and so on and so forth, it's actually refreshing to have a more casual laid back game that you don't necessarily have to take all very seriously. That's probably the best we can say about this game. You can enjoy it a great deal. You don't have to, t to take the story all very seriously, but you can certainly enjoy it a significant amount. That's all there is to say from my perspective. Cosine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and I'll see you boys and girls next time because I have plenty of videos to upload on the subject of this game.